Before we discuss persecution, I want to briefly recap, because I know we didn't hit all seven of the preceding, what we call beatitudes in the church world, attributes, traits, whatever that we're supposed to internalize. So I want to briefly recap those, and then we'll segue or transition into, into my assignment. Uh, for the sake of time, when I timed this out, this recap, it took me like five minutes last night. I'm going to give you some scriptural references. They're probably not the same scriptural references that were used earlier. So if you want to jot them down, you can be like the Bereans if you want, and you can go test me later. So let's get into the first one. Um, actually, you know what? Let me read through them first. Matthew chapter 5, I'll pick it up in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Uh, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So I really appreciate that, that throughout the day I, I heard mentioned a couple times something that, that, that I misunderstood, uh, though I didn't come to the church until my 20s, I, I did have some religious teaching, and I really misunderstood this list. You know, I, I thought it was okay to maybe identify with one or two types of this list. And, and I really appreciate that, that it's been pointed out today that these are all attributes, traits that need to be within us that we can pull out and use at different times when appropriate. And these are things that Jesus embodied, uh, well, does embody, but certainly embodied in his ministry here on earth. So, did you see any of these in yourself through the lessons and uh, through the breakout sessions that you were in? Do, 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 when you look at yourself, do you see that you're poor in spirit? Are you one of those that mourn? Are you the gentle? Are, are you those who hunger and thirst for righteousness? Are you the merciful? Are you the pure in heart? Or are you a peacemaker? And if you can say that you're any of those things, that's great. But now work on the other. Because we need to be, for Christ, that, that, that whole package. As, as Christ followers, we have the capacity to have all of these in our heart to use at the proper time. So here's the recap. The poor in spirit. This is the opposite. Uh, John did this with one of his. I love it. This is the opposite of pride conceit, and arrogance. The capacity to accurately and humbly assess ourselves in, is necessary to repent. And repentance is necessary to be in the kingdom of heaven. You can't get to heaven without this trait. Jesus starts this off by saying, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Interestingly, he ends with that same thing, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, when we, when we get to the... Uh, to the last of these. Those that mourn, uh, I mentioned this in the guy's breakout session, sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance without regret. 2 Corinthians 7.10, or part of it. There are times that we have to look around us at our lives, what's going on, and mourn. And that should motivate us to do something, to repent, to help call others to repentance, to instruct, to teach, to pray, whatever is appropriate. The gentle, the King James says meek, the gentle. And, and as Nathan mentioned, you know, it's not exactly the same as, as humble, but it, there's some similarities here. I would argue that the gentle are humble, hearted. I, I would argue that the gentle have a good understanding of how gentle God is with us, even though we don't deserve it. And the problem is, when in an in a, in a interpersonal relationship, in a, in a situation, when I choose not to restrain my power, 
When I try to overpower someone, when I try to get aggressive with someone, I rob God of the opportunity of blessing me in that situation. If I can be gentle the way he's been gentle with me, if there can be less of me and more of him, then it's always going to be a better outcome for me here on this earth and for the, person, the people I'm dealing with. And we see that in Scripture. But the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. Psalm 37, verse 11. You can go to Mark 10, 29, and 30, see a New Testament version. You can also go to uh, 2 Peter 3, 13, just jot that down for later, and look at maybe an eternal concept of inheriting the earth. But the big thing here is give God the opportunity to act on your behalf by being gentle in situations. My anger will never achieve the righteousness of God. I believe Brother James wrote that. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, to be righteous, and I was so, there was a young man over here who said it. I was so glad to hear it. To be righteous in a biblical context is to keep God's commandments. And two verses off the cuff that will we'll back that up. Psalms uh, 119, well, not off the cuff, I looked them up. Psalms 119, 172, and Luke 1, 6. Psalms 119, 172, and Luke 1, 6. It really connects those ideas. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You know, everything we chase after in this world is going to fade. Everything we chase after in this world... Nathan did a, a great job of talking about craving food. But you'll get hungry again. But when you hunger and thirst for righteousness, we can be truly filled. And, and where I would go for that is, is John 4, 13 and 14. And then I would also go to John chapter 7, verse 37 and 39. Think about that living water. That once you drink it, you never thirst again. The merciful... Now, I go to forgiveness for mercy. I think mercy and forgiveness go hand in hand. When we realize how merciful God has been to us, when we realize how much God has forgiven us, even though we don't deserve it, how can we not show that to others? And as a matter of fact, it's a requirement for going to heaven. It's not an option. Unfortunately, in the brotherhood, sometimes we think it is. And that's a problem. We've got to work on our heart condition. For if you forgive other people for their offenses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive other people, then your Father will not forgive you your offenses. Matthew 6, 14 through 15. The Son of God said that. This is a big deal. If you want shown mercy on the day of judgment, you've got to show it here on this earth. The pure in heart. This is specifically talking about people's my take on this, this is specifically talking about people's hearts that have been cleansed or purified by faith. And where I go to that uh, one place is Acts 15, 8 and 9, when um, they're dealing, when they're at the council and they're discussing uh, uh, the Gentiles being saved, uh, uh, Peter gets up and speaks and he says, and God, who knows the, is that Peter? no, it's James, excuse me, right? James? Uh, anyways, and God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. Man, I'm messing that up. Now that's going to bother me. Is that Peter? James, I'm going to have to go look it up. We'll go test that later. Okay. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. If we don't have that faith that gets us into Christ, there's no clean heart. We are stained by sin. The peacemakers. Man, in Isaiah 9, 6, Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. If we are Christ's followers, how can we not be about his business? How can we not be about peace as well? If we are his, we help make the world, we help bring peace to the world through prayer. We help bring peace to the world through our behavior, and we help bring peace to the world by biblical counseling and education, by sharing his word whenever we have the opportunity, by giving an account for the hope that is in us. So I'll ask again before we move on, are these attributes in you? 
And this leads us to, a, to my, my assignment, the always encouraging, uplifting topic of persecution. I kid, this is so sobering. Uh, so sobering. Yet, as Nathan said, there is a promise with it. The, uh, the seven uh, uh, attributes that we just talked about before, these are things we want to practice. Persecution, nobody wants to practice that. But these seven things, these we want to practice. And as we practice these, don't worry, persecution will come. It will. And Jesus has been very clear about this the whole time he was here on this earth. He was very clear about this with his disciples. He even goes on to talk about counting the cost of the cross, and, and we'll get there. If you practice these, these things, and you start to really live like Jesus, persecution will come, along with some promised blessings. In Mark chapter 10, 29 30, uh, those of you who know me know I love this passage. Uh, if you want to turn there with me, Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30. I shall pick it up in 28. Peter began to, to say to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sister or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Are the blessings of following Christ worth the persecution? In Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, we can pick it up in, in verse 20, and I'll read 26. Luke 9, 20 through 26. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. But he warned them and instructed them not to tell this to anyone, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul, or forfeits himself? <clears throat> Excuse me. For whosoever, or whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Are the blessings worth the persecution? Are the blessings worth picking up your cross daily and following him? Luke, uh, in Luke 14, verse 27, Jesus goes on to reiterate, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You cannot have the promised blessings without the promised persecution. So each person should consider the cost. Is Jesus worth it? Are the blessings worth it? I testify that it's worth it. That Jesus is worth it. That he is faithful. That he keeps his promises on this earth. And when you put him first, he does provide. And that he will keep his promises in eternity as well. And I know there's a lot of men and women who have also experienced this. And so if you're struggling in your faith, young people, talk to an older brother or sister that you see looking like Jesus. They will encourage you. They will pray for you. The blessings from Christ far outweigh any momentary persecution that I have endured. God rewards the faithful. Um, I was thinking about different things, and, and unfortunately, and we'll get there, but you know, there's a lot of, quote, persecution that isn't really persecution. There's a lot of just bad decisions 
they, they caused some problems, and, and, and Bill Anderson did a great job of pointing that out. Uh, when, when I first came out here to California, man, excuse me, guys, my, my son must have been like seven or eight years old, um, and, and we came out here, and I was doing some investment stuff, and I, and I brought a guy about five and a half million dollars in six months in investment, and it turned out that he was cooking the books. He, he died in custody, by the way. Um, uh, not to, I mean, he went to jail for a long time. Uh, it was very, well, thank you, brother. It was very unfortunate. Uh, uh, but but uh, that doesn't always happen. But when I found out what was going on, thank you, brother. When I found out what was going on, uh, I had to leave. It was in the middle of, of the crash. You know, this was around 2006, 2007, whatever that was. I mean, the, the market just tanked. Jobs were hard to come by. But as a Christian, how could I stay? How could I stay there and steal from people? I couldn't. So on uh, Valentine's Day, I talked to my wife, and, and I left. Uh, and, and then went to the proper authorities to stop anybody else from being robbed. Uh, and I was threatened. I was threatened to be sued. I was, I was threatened, uh, I was threatened uh, uh, to lose a lot. And, and I did end up losing about $50,000. Um, but there were people that lost a whole lot more. And then, you know, of course, the whole economy was in an uproar. People were being laid off. Somehow, I ended up getting a job making 14 bucks an hour throwing boxes and then became a supervisor. And it wasn't what I was making when I moved out here, but I was making close to 60 grand. And this was, you know, years ago. And, and, and God provided. While other people were being laid off and, and in horrible debt, and they were losing their homes. And we lost a home because he didn't honor our relocation agreement from Illinois. Uh, uh, but we were taken care of. Our food was provided for. Our, uh, we had shelter over our head. Uh, and, and we were good. And I remember this one time. <clears throat> and and uh, I was, you know, money was tight. Don't get me wrong. Money was tight. We were going through legal battles. Uh, 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 you know, it was, it was rough. Um, I'm trying to think how much of this story I should tell. But my son wanted a bicycle. I'm just trying to get through this without crying. And uh, we didn't have money. And I found this awesome jump bike. He and I used to ride BMXs together, and we'd go jumping and stuff on Craigslist. I mean, it was a, over a $1,000 Hoffman bike. And, and uh, uh, we got it dirt cheap. I mean, and I just took my hat off, my FedEx hat off. I was a supervisor at the time. And I looked at it. I was driving down the highway. And my son had never seen me cry before. And I just started crying. And he goes, Dad, why are you crying? And he remembers this story to this day. He goes, why are you crying? Because inside my hat, I had written a Bible verse. I've been young and now am old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. Psalm 37, 25. And I started crying. And he goes, Dad, why are you crying? I said, because God's got us. And he remembers that to this day. He, he'll talk to me about it when he's, when he's going through a hard time. These kinds of, of, of experiences can be defining moments in our lives. And they can be de defining moments for the people who see us going through these things and for the people that are going through them with us. These experiences deepen our faith and our trust in the Lord. They help us mature in our walk with Christ. I think this is what the Hebrew author is talking about. Let's turn there. In, in Hebrews chapter, chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Where, where, where they write, the Hebrew author writes about how God disciplines us like a father disciplines son. Let's pick it up uh, uh, in verse 4. I'm going to have to move quickly now. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? 
But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline, for the moment, seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. God allows us to go through things that will help us develop and be refined so that we can be holy with him, sharing his holiness. Peter discusses persecution that many of us have endured. And, and those of you who are going to school, maybe you endure some of this. In, in 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2 I'm going to read verse 12, and then I'm going to go to 3 through 13. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. I'm in James. Let me go to Peter. All right. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. We'll come back to that. And then 3... 13 through 16. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, and yet with gentleness and reverence, and keep a good conscience, so that in a thing in which they slander you, so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. When you endure people reviling you because your loving, respectful, good behavior convicts them, you plant the seed that just may grow into reconciling some of them to the Lord. Was that the five-minute bell? Yes. Okay. Uh, did you catch... How I describe that Christ-like behavior? Loving, respectful, it could add gentle in there, good. And 1 Peter 2, 13 through 19, Peter gives some instructions that we tend to struggle with. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors sent out as sent by him for punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence ignorant and foolish men. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor if for the sake of conscience toward God a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin you are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it and patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. So I'm going to have to rush through this. Well, recently, some of us thought there were some rules placed on us that were unreasonable. How does Peter say to deal with that? Do they disagree with God's law? Because if not, we obey. I don't get to just obey the nice boss. I don't get to just obey the nice president or whatever. Not according to what Peter said. Not according to the word of God. When I suffer unjustly and I show Jesus, I have the ability to plant a seed that God can use to grow, to convert people. So on the day of visitation, that's the day of judgment, more people can be rejoicing in heaven with us. And you have that ability too. 
Or we have the ability to be rude and disrespectful and rebellious and show everything Jesus is not. It's a hard thing. But think about what these people were living with. Nero, people being burned alive. They were dealing with far worse than we've had to deal with in the last few years. Far worse. That convicts me. And I'll read this last verse in in Peter and we'll quickly bring this to a close. In 1 Peter chapter, uh, let me say one more thing on this before I go on. The other thing is this. Did you catch what he said there too? Don't suffer as an evildoer. That's not persecution. If I go out and break the law, if I go out and am disrespectful and am not showing Jesus, I deserve what I get. That's not persecution. Persecution is when I'm doing the Jesus thing. Just to, to be really clear about that. Um, 1 Peter 4, 1 through 5. Let's read that. And this is the last I'll read in Peter. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose. Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For, there the, for the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatry. In all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them in the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. If you decide to put Jesus first, if you decide to try to live with the Christ-like characteristics we've discussed today, then the world will make fun of you, and they'll try and cancel you. I think that's a good modern way of putting it. But God's got you. You'll receive the promises that are on this earth and in the life to come, eternal life. You'll plant those seeds that will save some, and God will judge the rest. And if you'll bear with me just a few more moments, one very important thing for everyone here to realize, I talked about it a little bit prior, is you don't have to endure persecution alone. You have God, you have his word, and you have the church to encourage you. When your best friends, we talked about why you have friends in in the men's breakout, the the young men's breakout session. When your best friends, the people you're yoked with, are in the church of Christ, it's like in football, you know, if you're the quarterback or running back, you're not trying to make it to the end zone without blockers. When you're in the church, you've got blockers, and they are helping fend off the arrows of the evil one. And they're helping fend off the insults and, and the persecution of the world. You have people who have made it through it before you. You have people that are willing to go through it with you. Don't do it by yourself. Talk to somebody. Don't hold that stuff in. We'll pray with you. We'll encourage you. You never have to be alone when you're in the church. James 5.17 talks about that, right? The prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Don't go through it by yourself. Don't try to take any sin or sort of trial by yourself. We all need encouragement. Check out Hebrews chapter 3. Check out Hebrews 10. I'll read you two verses from Hebrews 3. Take care, brethren. This is Hebrews 3, 12 through 13. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast our assurance from the beginning until the end. The greatest reward, the greatest promise of all, is waiting for us. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. James 1.12 I hope, I pray that you will walk this path with us. I hope and I pray that you will count the cost of the cross 
look at the promises, look at what's expected, and make a, a, an informed decision about whether or not you want to pick up your cross daily. Great is the reward, but there will be hardships along the way. And again, you don't have to do it alone. The church is here for you. Eternal life is waiting for you. 